overcome by wildly raging waters. And we said that the language suggested that it was a satanic attack, an attempt to destroy the Lord and his people, an attempt, as it were, to destroy the church in its infancy before it could even get started. But Jesus, we saw, subdued the wind and the waves with a word, just a command. Well, in this passage, the presence of evil is not merely suggested, it is identified as the cause of this man's torment. And yet, here again, we see Jesus exercising his divine power over his evil opponents. We see him fulfilling his unique calling. If we think of, say, Isaiah 61, verse 1, uh, which announces, proclaims that what Jesus would come into the world to do, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, we see Jesus exercising his calling uh, in uh, freeing this man from his evil spirits. And he does this, as we see, not only in Israel, but among pagan peoples. And we're reminded here again that Jesus came to seek and save those who were lost out of every nation, tribe, and tongue. And this man of Gadara was a picture of the mass of sinners God would save with the coming, with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. And so our theme this morning as we look at Mark chapter 5, verses 1 to 20 is this, Jesus frees a demon-possessed pagan from a host of evil spirits. Jesus frees a demon-possessed pagan from a host of evil spirits. We'll see in the first place the situation, in the second place, the deliverance. In the third place, the response. But as Jesus frees a demon-possessed pagan from a host of evil spirits, we see in the first place the situation, what was going on here. And we're picking up, as we said, from where we stopped the last time. The sea had calmed down, and we said it was a, a stillness that was even beyond normal stillness at the command of Jesus. And Jesus and his disciples obviously were able to continue to sail eastward across the Sea of Galilee, and they dropped anchor in a place called Gadara. And in other parts, in other uh, Gospels, you will find it called Gerasa or Gergasa. Same thing, uh, Gadara. And Gadara was one of ten Roman cities which made up what was called the Decapolis. As uh, is mentioned in verse 20, the, the, uh, the, the exercised man went out to the, the, the Decapolis and began to, to talk about what Jesus had done for him. And Decapolis simply means ten cities, um, ten Roman cities that, uh, that made up one uh, community that were called the Decapolis. And the point is, Jesus, by crossing the Sea of Galilee and entering the Decapolis, and especially Gadara, he was out of Jewish territory. And they were uh, in very pagan territory, and, and these people were very pagan. In fact, in uh, Isaiah 65, verse 4, and listen to Isaiah 65, verse 4, and uh, try to catch some of the uh, connotations, some of the allusions to the people in Gadara and what, what happened in this account here. In Isaiah 65, verse 4, God, through his prophet, describes those who uh, he considers an abomination against him and who we would consider pagans. Isaiah 65, verse 4, um, uh, these are the ones that the Lord, that turns the stomach of the Lord this way, who sit among the graves and spend the night in the tombs, who eat swine's flesh and the broth of abominable things in their vessels. And these are the ones who then God finds abominable. And so these pagan peoples uh, um, were, from the perspective of God, abominable. But pagans, too, need the gospel. And it was always God's intention, as we have said many times, that the church would include both Jewish and non-Jewish converts to Christianity, even the most vile. We saw a while, a few weeks ago, um, Naaman the Syrian being brought into the church, being uh, made a convert, and we mentioned at that time people like Rahab the prostitute from Jericho, Ruth the Moabitess, and there are many, many more in the Old Testament. Here we see the Lord, Jesus, bringing the good news of salvation to not just pagans, but these were dedicated pagans, unclean people according to Jewish law. And he does this by saving, he doesn't start small as we would say, he does so by saving the most wretched man in the land. Uh, we would say the worst of the worst, the man who people were most afraid of, the last man people would expect to, say, find religion. Mark records that immediately, as soon as Jesus came out of the boat, that is, this man ran to him. And he was 
the nastiest character we could imagine. We're told that he had an unclean spirit. Now, one of the afflictions in that time uh, was the possession of people by evil spirits. Now, liberal scholars today would say that these people were merely deranged. And we shouldn't take that too seriously. Maybe the Bible writers were just writing it this way, but there was no such thing as evil spirits, no such thing as demonic possession, because today we can explain away these things. Maybe it was just schizophrenia or some kind of mental disorder, and they would say these things can be explained away very easily. So far, so good. You know, yes, there are things today that we could explain. We say, you know, such and such is can be um, uh, attributed to, to a mental disorder or whatever, but... When we come to the accounts in the Bible of demonic possession and their healing, just to say that these things were just psychological does not explain away these things. It, because uh, such an explanation does not account for the fact that these people were cured immediately, on the spot, by Jesus. That's something that the best psychologist or psychiatrist in the world cannot do. Not with, and they were healed, not with years of medication and therapy, you know, sitting on somebody's couch and talking about your childhood and all that. Jesus instantly healed them. And so to say that, you know, these things can be explained away by science today is just a cop-out um, because it doesn't explain, it doesn't account for the fact that Jesus healed these people instantaneously. Add to that as well what the spirits confessed when they came face to face with Jesus. If you look at the Bible, in every case, before even Jesus said a word, he didn't have to introduce himself in any way, but before Jesus even said a word, these evil spirits spoke things that the possessed person could not have known. They would say things like, you know, we, we looked at this in chapter 1, verse 24, they would call Jesus the Holy One of God. Uh, in chapter 3, verse 11, we hear of demons uh, screaming and shouting out that Jesus was the Son of God. And in our present passage, the demons uh, uh, describe Jesus as the Son of the Most High God. And the demons would speak of Jesus having the power to destroy them and send them into the abyss and, and, and things like this. Well, this man from Gadara was indwelt by evil spirits, in fact, a great number of them. They identify themselves in verse 9 as legion, which was the name of a large troop of Roman soldiers, which could number sometimes up to 5,600. That's not to say there were 5,600 evil spirits in this man, but a great number, at least enough to um, enter into 2,000 pigs, as we saw. And these demons tormented this man. They drove him away from regular society to the tombs which were situated in the mountainside and to the tombs where the dead are buried. That alone, just the thought of this man or where he was living is enough to give you the heebie-jeebies. And verse 15 suggests that he was also unclothed. He was most likely unbathed and unshaved and there would have been bloody cuts all over his body that he inflicted himself with these stones that are mentioned in verse 5. And again, demons will do that if we go by what the Bible says. They will try to get you to hurt yourself. In Mark 9, verse 17 and on following, Jesus will meet a father of a uh, spirit-possessed boy who will tell Jesus that his boy, being possessed by, the Holy, uh, by this evil spirit, foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, becomes rigid, and how the spirit would often throw the boy into the fire or into water to try to destroy him. And again, that was the case here. The demons caused the man to cut himself, to try to hurt himself, and to ensure that no one could help this poor wretch, the demons also gave him superhuman strength. Mark tells us that no one could bind him. They couldn't restrain him. And it's not that they didn't try. Verse 4 tells us that, that he had often been bound with shackles and chains. Now shackles, uh, boys and girls, or manacles it's called, are really clasps. Picture big bracelets that they put on your hands, and uh, there's, there's uh, a chain in between, a strong chain. So when you're, you're clasped in these manacles, you can't move, and they put some on your feet as well. And they're meant uh, to restrict a person's movement. They're meant to keep a person bound so they can't do damage to themselves or to other people, to, to attack other people. Um, sometimes prisoners are chained in this way. Even the Apostle Peter in Acts chapter 12, uh, verse 6, is... Uh, we're told that he was bound with two chains, probably one on the hands and one on the feet, to pre prevent his escape. 
And the Apostle uh, Paul would speak of his chains as well. And even today, uh, prisoners are chained hand and feet if they have to be moved from one place to another. The difference with this demon-possessed man was that the chains were not able to restrict him. With almost Samson-like power, he broke them and he pulled them apart. He snapped them like macaroni. Verse 5 speaks of him crying out as well. And the Greek verb here has a sense of crying out loudly. And so not only was he creepy looking and frightening looking, he let out this blood-curdling cry all the time as he wandered through the tombs and in the mountainsides. The word that is, uh, is translated crying out in the Greek is used to describe in Greek writings the sound of a raven making a very loud cry. Uh, it can be translated wailing. So he was wailing through the tombs and through the mountains, making a loud sound but without any discernible words. We might call it a, a blood-curdling scream. And this man's life was the stuff that scary stories are made of, but this was real. This is the kind of person, boys and girls, that your, your mom and dad would, uh, would use to scare you, to, to behave and to do certain things, and they would say to you, perhaps, maybe the parents in that day did that. They would say, you better wash up for supper, or the man from the tomb is going to come get you, you know, and uh, right away, okay, you better wash up quick, you know. This is the kind of person that they would use to scare, <laughs> uh, probably use to scare little children. And yet, this was the welcoming committee that met Jesus as soon as he stepped out of that boat in Gadara. This man's situation was indeed quite horrible. He was filled with a raging fury, and he was raving mad. And congregation, this man is a reminder of why we need to believe in Jesus and stay close to him all through our lives. You know, Ephesians 2, verse 2, teaches that those who do not believe in Jesus are walking according to the prince of the power of the air. You know who that is? That's Satan. Those who do not believe in Satan or in Jesus are walking according to the prince of the power of the air. That is Satan. And so unbelievers are all demon-possessed in a manner of speaking because they are led into, um, into continued rebellion against God. In 2 Timothy 2 verse 26, Paul speaks of those who oppose what the church teaches as being in the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. In 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4, he speaks of those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this world, that is Satan, whose minds the God of this world has blinded. And even the church is warned, isn't it, in Ephesians 6, verse 12, and this is very, a very familiar passage, Ephesians 6, verse 12, that even the church is warned, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. And so we're reminded this morning that reading of demons and evil spirits is not just a history lesson. It's a reminder of how much we all need Jesus, and it is a warning to stay very close to Jesus. But back to the Gadarene demoniac, Jesus had arrived, and this man was about to receive the gift of salvation. As Jesus frees a demon-possessed pagan from a host of evil spirits, we now see in the second place the deliverance. Verse 6 re records a strange thing, something we wouldn't really expect, that when the man saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshipped. Again, not what we would expect. We'd more expect to read, and the man ran away from Jesus, or the man tried to attack Jesus in some way, but that's not what happened. And here we see something of the divine power and authority of Jesus, and indeed of the Almighty God that is shown in Jesus. Even the demons submit to him, whether they like it or not. And this is not to say that they liked Jesus, that they wanted to worship him. We're saying they have to worship Jesus whether they like it or not. And the word worship here cannot be a, uh, mistaken for anything else but a bowing down before someone to whom honor and reverence is due. That's what the Greek word means. Bowing down before someone to whom honor and reverence is due. That is what they did before Jesus. Obviously, by their shrieking questions, the demons didn't care for Jesus coming into their stomping ground. But his appearance forced them to do what all creatures must do before the Lord of the universe. They must bow before him. They must worship him. And it reminds us of how absolutely important it is that we know Jesus. Because, you know, someday, every one of us 
will appear before the glorious yet terrifying holiness of God. And if these powerful demons prostrated themselves before Jesus, we cannot even begin to imagine the fear that will fill those who stand before the consuming fire that is God, clothed only in their own pride, stubbornness, and unbelief. And so Lord, let, us, let this passage this morning uh, deliver to us a call to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the Savior of sinners and who has opened the gates of righteousness for us that we may then come boldly into the presence of the Lord our God. And as believers, let us rejoice in the Savior that God has provided. Well, what happens next? Verse 8 tells us that Jesus had commanded the evil spirit to come out of the man. And verse 7 tells us the response. And he cried out with a loud voice, that is the man speaking by the demons, and he cried out with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. In that, what we can imagine to be a shrieking, blood-curdling voice, the demons addressed Jesus as the Son of the Most High. And this title ascribes to God transcendence and exaltation over all the pagan gods and goddesses, all the deities conceived by the foolish minds of men. And they beg Jesus not to send them out of the country, which assumes that Jesus had the power, and they knew Jesus had the power to send them away. But then we read in verses 11 to 13, Now a large herd of swine was feeding there near the mountains. So all the demons begged him, saying, Send us to the swine that we may enter them. And at once Jesus gave them permission. Then the unclean spirits went out and entered the swine. There were about 2,000. And the herd ran violently down the steep place into the sea and drowned in the sea. Now this herd of pigs remind us again that Jesus was not in Jewish territory. Pigs were unclean animals according to the Mosaic law. And here in Gadara, pigs were obviously big business. And the demons begged Jesus to allow them to enter the pigs rather than be driven away from the country. And Jesus, we read, gave them permission. And again, we're reminded of the power that Jesus possessed. What authority was his that the demons sought leave of him. And what an encouragement it is for us then, boys and girls, to pray to Jesus, to help us. Because we're reminded here again that there is nothing and no one that is outside of the control of Jesus. And so it should encourage us to pray to Jesus always. And what motivation for us, people of God, that in all our trials and temptations, we should be willing to take it to the Lord in prayer as we sing. Indeed, what a friend we have in Jesus who is sovereign over all creation. But then what are we to make of these poor pigs? Well, the old saying when pigs fly, came true, didn't it? But they didn't fly for long. They fell into the sea and drowned. And Peter would be horrified. Now, you know who Peter is. Peter doesn't stand for people eating delicious animals or, or tasty animals, but people for the ethical treatment of animals. They would be horrified. And what about the owners? What a financial loss to their wallets. What are we to make of this? And I think as sad as it is, we have to keep our thoughts off the pigs and remain focused on the deliverance of the demon-possessed man. Because in the context of the whole Bible, the rescue and the restoration of one person is more important than vast wealth. We might be reminded here of what Jesus tells us in Matthew 10, verse 31 that to our Heavenly Father, we are worth more than many sparrows. And here we see, in fact, how much more we are worth. We are more, worth more than 2,000 pigs. And that still only scratches the surface of how much God is willing to pay for you and me. In fact, in Romans 8, verse 32, we are told that God did not spare His own Son, but gave Him up for us all. Peter reminds us in 1 Peter 1, 18-19 that we were redeemed, that is, we were bought back, we were ransomed, not with silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish or spot. Jesus himself said in Mark 10, 
verse 45, that he came to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Now many pigs were lost to deliver one man from demon possession. But congregation, the image of those pigs leaping over that cliff to their deaths should remind us that our salvation came at an even higher cost. The life of Jesus, Son of the Most High God. But as Jesus frees a demon-possessed pagan from a host of evil spirits, we see in the third place the response. What was the reaction to this miracle that Jesus had performed? And we see two here. We see the reaction of the people and of the man who had been healed. The people, we're told in verse 15, became afraid. And it draws our thoughts back to the previous passage in Mark 4, the reaction of the disciples in the boat with Jesus when they, they saw him command the wind and the waves, the elements of nature, and they obeyed him. And the sea died down, the wind went away, quieted down immediately. Their reaction was they became frightened. Here again, the people come out. Those who were employed feeding the pigs had witnessed what Jesus had done, and they went, according to verse 14, into the city and into the country. In other words, they went everywhere, and they told everyone what they had seen, and people came out in droves. And when they arrived, they had a shock. The man whom they had feared for so long, that screaming, uncontrollable maniac, was sitting he was clothed, and he was in his right mind. He was reminded here of the sea, which was calmed at the word of Jesus. And the people who came, they asked, how, how is this possible? And indeed, the swine herders could not stop talking about it, how Jesus had commanded the evil spirits to come out of the man, and how the spirits had begged in that demonic voice to be sent into the pigs, and Jesus allowed them to do it. And those little piggies went wee, wee, wee right off the mountainside into the ocean and died. And you know, we, what, we would, what we would expect to read next is something that would have sounded like this. And all the people bowed down before Jesus and praised God that he had sent him into their land. Well, we don't read that, do we? We read that they became afraid. And as we said last time, the presence of God will do that. But that fear did not lead the next step to faith. In fact, in verse 17, we read, Then they began to plead with him to depart from their region. See, they looked at this whole situation and they concluded, You know what? This Jesus is bad for the economy of Gadara. He's going to break us. He's going to break the bank. They could not afford to have him around. He's got to go. And, you know, again, this gives us a picture of the condition of the human heart, doesn't it? The treasures of this world, which, as Jesus tells us, rusts and fade away. Quite often to the human heart, the treasures of this world are worth more than following Jesus. The cost of being a disciple is too great quite often. And it is only by God's mercy and grace, sending His Holy Spirit into our hearts, that we can begin to see Jesus as the priceless treasure that He is. Apart from the Spirit's work, we would continue to worship the God of wealth and luxury and comfort. But there was another response, that of the man who had been healed from demon possession. He begged Jesus, we read, that He might be with Him. Now, a short time ago, a different kind of begging had been coming out of his mouth, not to be tormented, not to be sent away from the country. Now he was begging that he might accompany Jesus and be near him. And again, that should not be surprising for us. When we are truly released from our sin, we want to be near Jesus. Don't we sing? Nearer, still nearer, close to thy heart, draw me, my Savior, so precious thou art. We understand that. We can relate to this man. We want to be near to Jesus if we are truly converted, if we are tr truly saved. But then in verses 19 to 20, we read, However, Jesus did not permit him, but said to him, Go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has had compassion on you. And he departed and began to proclaim in Decapolis all that Jesus had done for him, and all marveled. Jesus had a different plan for this man. Literally in the Greek, he says to him, go to your house, to yours, 
and tell them. Go to your house, to yours, and tell them. Now, yours would include his family, his friends, his people, people of his town or city. And he had to tell them what the Lord had done for him and about the compassion that had been shown to him. Jesus, we would say, commissioned this man to be a missionary of the best kind who could testify from personal experience of the power and the kindness of God. But notice that this man began to proclaim all that Jesus had done for him. Jesus says, go and proclaim what God has done. He goes and he begins to proclaim Jesus. This is yet another way that we're pointed to the divinity of Jesus. This, the formerly demon-possessed demon man preached Jesus as the, as the God who had had mercy on him and had healed him. And it seems, if we go by the rest of Scripture, that he was faithful in doing it. And the Lord blessed the word that he spoke. Because in Mark 7, verse 31 to 32, we read this. Again, departing from the region of Tyre and Sidon, he came through the midst of the region of Decapolis to the Sea of Gal Galilee. That is, Jesus came again to the region of Decapolis. Then they, that is, obviously people who had now come to believe in Jesus, they brought to him one who was deaf and had an impediment in his speech, and they begged him to put his hand on him. These same people who at one point were saying, please leave, go away from here, we don't want you here, you're going to break the bank, now we're bringing someone to Jesus and begging him to heal them. And so the former demoniac had faithfully been preaching the gospel in the absence of Jesus, because the next time Jesus passed through that area, people were bringing him a man to be healed. And in Mark 8, we read of a great multitude being with Jesus three days. And so the gospel had borne fruit in the pagan land of the Decapolis. Congregation, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Mark sets before us this morning the power and the compassion of Jesus once again and the perfection of Jesus to be our Savior. And it reminds us of God's desire to save sinners from every nation, race, and language as pagan as they might be. And it reminds us that no matter how horrific is our sin, no matter how deep in the pit we think we are, Jesus saves, and only He alone can save. He came to free the captive. He came to break the prisoner's chains. He came to release us from slavery to sin. He Himself said these words in John 8, verse 34 to 36, Most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin, and a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. That's the gospel promise. Believe in the son and you will be free. And this gospel calls us this morning again to either say, Lord, I want to be near you. I want to go with you. Or it may draw from us the response, please go away from me. It calls us to answer the question, is Jesus worth following? Is he worth giving up so much of what we love and possess? Or is he too much trouble? Does he ask too much? Let us remember to surrender our wills to Jesus. Let us leave behind what enslaves and find true freedom in him alone. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, indeed we are reminded here this morning that we are deeply depraved. We too are sinners. We are, apart from your Holy Spirit, demon-possessed and led by our sinful nature, our sinful inclinations, pulling us to what? What is unlawful, what is wicked continually, but... It has not been your will to leave us in our misery, to leave us in the pigsty of our lives. You have sent your Son to save us. You have provided the perfect Savior, who is God himself, who exhibited his sovereign power over the elements of nature, over the evil spirits, over diseases, and finally over sin as he surrendered himself to death on the cross. We pray that we may look to Jesus, that we may not allow demons and evil spirits to rule our lives and even our evil hearts to rule us, but we, we may look to Jesus and find true freedom. Indeed, Father, 
Help us to surrender our wills to Jesus, leaving behind what enslaves, finding true freedom in him. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's return to number 439, and we rise to sing stanzas 3 and 4 at this time. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, help us to come with joyful hearts, with thankful hearts, as we bring our offerings before you this morning. We thank you for the offering cause for Mid-America Reform Seminary. We pray for the seminary community, community in light of the uh, recent uh, difficulties that they have experienced, and we pray for your continued uh, blessing upon uh, the church community as we support uh, Mid-America financially and prayerfully. We pray for the professors for the students as they teach and as they are taught in preparation for the gospel ministry. Father, again, we're reminded of how desperately the world needs the preaching of the gospel. And uh, apart from that preaching and the work of your Holy Spirit, we would remain, uh, as it were, demon-possessed and led by Satan. Help us, O Lord, uh, to be joyful in our giving this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 